ladies and gentlemen, good evening. If you are ready to start the second part of our conference, we are here. <laughs> and we are looking forward to this debate. Uh, the topic of the second panel is Understanding of the Year 1980 in Western and Central Europe. And the questions we are going to discuss are if there are differences in understanding this important year uh, between Western and Central Europe. And if so, what are they and how are they reflected in different approaches to today's reality? And also if uh, the year 1918 also is perceived as a year of emergence of new states in Western Europe, and how was the breakdown of old empires viewed in Belgium and Finland? Because we have two distinguished guests uh, from these countries tonight. So it's my pleasure first to introduce our panel. Uh, there is, uh, I will start with a lady. Uh, Martel Klenken from Belgium, Assistant Professor at University of Vienna. Good evening. Uh, there is Kale Kalio, uh, who came from Finland, Director uh, at the Finnish Labour Museum, Herstas. Uh, and Lukas Jasina, historian from Poland. Good evening. And the Czech Republic is represented uh, by Václav Kunesh, history teacher. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so we have decided to start with four little presentations in the beginning because we have uh, four very different realities now and I'm very sure that probably you are not like very much uh, uh, informed about the history of Finland in detail and we have an occasion today to uh, hear the story of Finland too. So uh, I would like to ask you first uh, to give us the point of view of Finland on what happened in 1918. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here in this second session. And of course, the first session was the 100th anniversary of some countries, and now we are going to 200th anniversary of Karl Marx. So, his birthday in this country, if you are thinking, why on earth I'm here, that's the reason because I'm the most looking person in the, in the world of history of this, this great man. But, but to be serious, uh, dear friends, uh, Finnish parliament declared uh, Finland independent 6th of December, already 1917. Therefore, the whole last year was for the celebrations of centen centennial anniversary of independent Finland. As a historian, it was really interesting to notice what parts of our past were remembered uh, Year 1917 was not heroic, really. It was more like a chaotic one. We were simply lucky. Uh, thanks for the Russian Revolution, weakness of Bolsheviks, and German success in the Eastern Front of World War I. Uh, there was also hunger, uh, disobeying Russian soldiers in Finland, and also young Finnish men who went to Germany to get military training needed for long-awaited national uprising. Uh, Finland was a grand duchy uh, with reduced autonomy, but clearly part of Russia as well. Imperial Russia was truly a prison of nations, but it was also a prison uh, for its citizens. When the empire broke, there were those who wanted to free their nations and those who wanted to free the citizens. And these movements did not always share the same goals. At the last day of 1917, leading Bolsheviks promised to recognize Finnish independence. Lenin did not give us our independence, he had no other choice to do. Uh, state power had collapsed in Finland in 1917. There was no army, there was no real police, huge amount of strikes, rationing of food, black market and inflation. The first security guards were founded in summer 1917 and soon they had weapons. <coughs> Labour movement had their own militia and right wing did the same. In January 1918 we were in a bloody civil war. Reds had the cities and southern Finland, whites secured the rest of the country. 
Red side uh, got support from Bolsheviks, white from uh, Germany and Sweden. Tides had turned when Russians sailed away and Germans steamed in. Mm -hmm. It was for, for, for the, uh, war, the war was over already in May, and, and uh, for the Finns it was a war of amateurs, uh, where most of the people uh, died not on battlefield but by terror and executions. Whites were more skillful in this respect too. Red terror was pretty random and based on personal hate. White army cleaned uh, the areas uh, they conquered <coughs> with military justice, uh, mass executions, prison camps and severe punishment. At the end of the war, 17,000 people were in prison camps where 12 thousand died in hunger and diseases. Uh, in total, civil wars caused 37,000 uh, deaths, mainly from the red side. It was over 1% of our population who died in violence. Winners called uh, their one war as a war of uh, liberation. Not a very balanced name when Russian troops in Finland tried to get home without fighting and German troops occupied Helsinki. Finland did not turn as a servant state of Germany only thanks to the collapse of German Empire at the end of 1918. Without that we would not have become a republic but a kingdom with a, a German prince. The red side remembered the war as a class war. This was a biased name as well, even though people with property were on the white side, but uh, they were not intentionally attacking lower classes, which formed a huge ma majority in our poor northern country. In everyday speech, it was simply a rebellion. The historical research and strong need for reconciliation after the Second World War created the need for new names. War of Liberation was replaced with War of Citizens or even War of Brothers. They were politically correct but historically inaccurate names. The historical research intensed in 1990s and in a special project uh, project, all the victims were catalogued. Uh, new generation of researchers agreed that civil war is the only proper name which does not take any stand. The war is hell, anyway. This spring in Finland has been full of historical interest and discussions about our civil war. History is everywhere, and year 1918 seems to be much more interesting than 1970, official year of our national anniversary. I am happily surprised that today there is much more mutual understanding than before. Red stories and white stories are becoming history and only debaters from older generations still use civil war as a tool for history politics. Personally, I believe that it is much more important that today we have more neutral understanding of civil war as history. There is no point to form historical reconciliation and pose any apologies when uh, there are no actors alive. In 1940s and 1950s, we had leading politicians who had really participated in the civil war in the uh, ranks of red and white troops. They were able to govern together our country, so why we would need a national reconciliation of issues, no one is any more responsible. Thank you. Thank you, Callum, for this uh, very clear explanation. And now the floor is yours. What about Belgium? Thank you very much. 1918 on itself is not so much, not so meaningful in the case of Belgium. In Belgium, what one remembers is the whole chain of events starting from 1914 until 1918. It's the whole context of the, what is called the Great War. 
this is a very important period for collective memory that we already start with a small comparison to, for instance, the Polish case. Until today, in Poland, World War II is much more important in collective memory than World War I. That is different in the case of Belgium. In the case of Belgium, it's definitely World War I that is more important in collective frameworks of memory than World War II. And World War I is remembered as this impossible task of stopping the German invasion. Um, Germany crossed the border with Belgium. It wanted to invade France and it needed to cross through Belgium. And the Belgian king had said no. And there was an, uh, it defended, the Belgian military defended Liège, and there was a short stop in the, in the route of the German troops. Later on, they moved on until the front line was reached, which for the rest of the war actually came to lay in the south west of Belgium and in the north of France for more than three years. So there were trenches, and the war was going on right there. And Belgium itself was occupied, and um, there were a lot of people fleeing away. Uh, more than half a million people actually stayed until the end of the war in exile, either in the Netherlands, in Great Britain, or in France. And in Belgium, in occupied Belgium, there was a kind of police state installed. And there was also a kind of experiment of uh, the German occupier to come up with a flam politic. So it means to be a a political regime specifically designed for uh, Flemish people, so it made division for the first time in the history of the Belgian Kingdom between people that spoke a different language and the way they were approached. And then it's um, August 1918, and there is, well, the, uh, together with the Allied forces, um, one fights back, <coughs> and the Germans can be defeated, but this was an overall European story. In the end, um, on Belgian territory, there were one million people that were either wounded or um, uh, killed. And so especially in the southwest of Belgium, you have huge fields with huge um, war cemeteries from with Canadian, with American, with Australian, all kinds of um, nationalities. Um, yeah, that's the story about the war. But, in fact, it belonged to the victory, uh, the, the countries that um, well, came victoriously out of the war, but it's not how it is perceived. In fact, when um, on the negotiation tables in Versailles later on in 1919, um, from all the Allied powers, Belgium was the, was the country that received the least amount of territorial gain, apart from Portugal, so the only territorial gains it, um, could get as a small piece of strip of land um, at the Belgian-German border that joined the Belgian Kingdom. So <coughs> this is referred to as Open Almady. Um, and it received um, Rwanda, um, Rwanda Wundi in, um, in, in Africa under the auspicious, but it was still under the auspicious of the League of Nations. And um, the general feeling um, within Belgium was one, not one of, um, well, having won the war, but it was one of the um, of a total loss, uh, a loss of a lot of people, a loss of economic proper, uh, prosperity. It used to be the fifth most um, uh, prosperous uh, countries in the world. Um, we had all these refugees. There was hunger during the war. There was this um, increased political tensions among the population because of this wrong well, German occupation of regime and how it had acted. And these were things that stayed. And we will talk about the memory of World War I uh, later on, but one of the, the, the stable elements in this narr narration is for sure pacifism and anti-militarianism. <coughs> Thank you very much. Let's hear Lukas and uh, the Poland story. 1918 is for Poles mostly symbolic here, not the moment of, uh, of independence itself, because and that's comparable with Belgium. Polish independence was a result of the chain of events which started at the beginning of the First World War. To be honest, there was a lot of proclamation of the independent Polish state. Some of them were made by German Emperor and Austrian Emperor in 1916. Uh, the others were made by rivalizing Polish powers and Polish political um, movements. Uh, the symbolic date 
November 11th of 1918, which is a symbol of the, of the end of the war uh, in the Western Europe, which is in Poland relatively unknown, was, was chosen because of the, the most important personality responsible for Polish independence. It was the moment when Józef Piłsudski was released. Uh, the future leader of the Polish state was released from German prison and came back to Warsaw. This date was chosen 20 years after the, uh, the fact. It, 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 it makes Poland probably the last country of those who celebrate this, this moment to choose where exactly this moment was. But of course, um, Polish concept of, um, of independence of 1918 uh, hides completely any memory of the First World War. Poland is a country where if somebody is interested in policy of memory on, on 1918, which is completely not which completely not participate in any discussion of the First World War. That's, uh, that's a very strange thing because First World War and the Polish territories were probably very cruel and comparable only with this war in the territories of Belgium or Eastern France. All the fronts, all the armies of Germans and Russians were switching from eastern to western part of Poland within three years of the war. Now it's completely forgotten because this war is remembered mostly as a source and our instrument to giving Poland back an independence. Uh, we have very, we get very different concept than Finland. Uh, because Polish concept of independence is mostly a concept of national unity, not the civil war like, uh, like in Finland. Uh, 1918 is probably the moment of the most symbolic Polish national unity between uh, the right-wing parties, socialists and the others, supported together Polish authorities which were receiving the independence. The wars we had, uh, the wars started in 1918 were mostly wars with our neighbours or with uh, Bolshevik Russia or with Germany. Uh, there were no strong wars inside the country, any. Uh, military achievements happened in Poland in 1918 where we cannot classify them as a, as a civil war. This concept created in the 20s were so, which was so strong that even during the communism, the official communist historiography was unable to change that. They were only trying to involve in this concept a more positive role of the October Revolution and decision of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin which was a ritual and never was really accepted by always strongly anti-communist Polish society. This concept uh, uh, now works exactly like that, exactly like before the Second World War. Of course, there are much more discussions on the um, non-very idealistic part of our independence and its origins, but that's a very usual thing in Europe. Now we are much more able to discuss the black parts than we were uh, exactly 100 years ago. Uh, the present Polish policy of memory also is not an object of any conflict between Polish government and, and the opposition, which is, if somebody is orientated in Polish political life, rather unique opportunity. As a historian, I'm, I'm very happy of this, that we can still have some problems like that, which are um, accepted by a majority of the Polish society. Uh, maybe because all possible fathers of independence we celebrate. All the moments we've got to commemorate uh, uh, are able to be accepted by almost everyone. Uh, also, 1918 is not the most controversial problem of the Polish, Polish remembrance now. We are much more focused on the Second World War and all events connected with this uh, horrible moment of our history. Uh, that's we discuss, that's the most controversial problems we have to tense with our neighbors. Of course, when you design Polish policy of memory now, there is some possible there is some possibility of the historical conflicts of the conflicts of policy of memory with some of our neighbors. Maybe there is a dif little different definition of, 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 of conflict in Czech uh, Silesia with our Czech friends or uh, there will be a lot of controversies on the of fighters with uh, our Ukrainian neighbors. But still, it doesn't make these controversies important enough to be afraid. Uh, to resume, Poland is probably a country with the most positive remembrance of 1918. 
Uh, even the victims, even the cruelties, which are not so remembered like the cruelties from the Second World War, uh, are not for Poles important enough to hide, to cover uh, this important factor which was uh, accepted by all part of intelligentsia and political society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lukasz. And if we are already here with the pictures, are we? Okay, great. So we can uh, hear a little bit uh, the Czechoslovak story uh, from the point of view of Václav. Okay, hi, good evening. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Václav Kunesh. I'm a teacher of history, so I'm not a professional historian, uh, neither a scientist, but I'll try to remind us of some basic facts about uh, Czech and Slovak history in 1918. Uh, so first we can look at the map of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, whose part was also Bohemia, Moravia, uh, Slovakia as well. Uh, you can see here the uh, ethnic map or the national map of the monarchy. Uh, and I'd like to remind a uh, few myths about uh, the rising or the establishment of Czechoslovakia. Uh, the first one is that the Czechs uh, always wanted to be totally independent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, this is probably a myth because uh, for the whole 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Czechs uh, only desired autonomy within Austro-Hungarian monarchy. And there were almost no dreams of becoming uh, completely independent of uh, the empire. Uh, the second myth, there was a common history of the Czechs and the Slovaks. Uh, this is also very problematic because, as you can see in the map as well, uh, the Slovaks belong to the Hungarian part of the empire, uh, not to the same as we did. Uh, so there are, of course, contacts. Uh, these two nations are very close to each other, uh, but we can't say that they have a common history. Uh, the Czechs had their own uh, Czech kingdom in medieval ages, and the history of Slovakia was uh, completely different. It was always a part of Hungary. Uh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, here we can see the three politicians who are the most important ones for establishing of Czechoslovakia. Uh, perhaps you know the names of all of them. So uh, I had to mention uh, Professor Masaryk as the one who uh, was one of the first ones who thought uh, that the war and the Austrian participation in the war uh, could be a turning point for the Czechs to uh, start uh, to fight to be free and to become independent of Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So, as most of you know, uh, Professor Masaryk left the monarchy in 1914 and he started to travel a lot and to persuade uh, the statesmen in uh, the states of the Triple Entente, the Allies, to uh, support his project of the Czechoslovak state. He also invented the idea of Czechoslovakism, which was very problematic future, uh, in the future, and it uh, affected the uh, relations between the Czechs and Slovaks a lot. Uh, but he needed to have an idea for crea creation of a new state, and he needed to say that the Czechs and the Slovaks are only the branches of one huge nation, because he needed uh, the majority of the Slavic population in his new state that he planned. Uh, Edward Banesh uh, started to organize a home resistance, called Mafia, but he didn't finish it because he had to flee as well. Uh, Milan Stefanik was a key person for organizing our legions, which uh, I've mentioned now. Thank you. Uh, the key role for uh, the international support for the future uh, Czechoslovak project uh, had the legions, uh, because uh, not every soldier uh, wanted to fight for the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. There were 90,000 soldiers who uh, decided to fight for uh, the states of the Triple Entente, about 60,000 of them in Russia, but also in France and in Italy. Uh, this is a poster of uh, the legionaries in France. Uh, as you can see, it's a commemoration of the famous uh, Hussites in the 15th century. Uh, it's a very famous period in our history, and it should motivate the soldiers to become a part of the legions uh, and to remind them of the victorious predecessors in the 15th century. So that's a picture of the France, French legions. 
And here we can see a very famous picture from the Russian ones. It was, as you know, in 1918, uh, our legions in Russia, uh, they are very uh, successful in fighting against the Red Army in Siberia. And in one time, they uh, controlled the whole Trans-Siberian Railway. And here we can see a picture of the soldiers uh, who already fought for uh, the Czech state. Uh, you can see that they reminded uh, themselves of the history like the Prague Castle and the national symbols. Uh, for those who don't speak Czech, the translation of the text is uh, you, uh, the glory of the Czechs, you are alive as you once were, and you will live in our hearts. So this is very typical to show that these legions, these legionaries, already fought for uh, their own state for the future. Okay. Uh, so the, the international support uh, was granted, especially by American President Wilson, and other statesmen of France, so Italy, uh, and other countries of the Triple Entente, uh, mostly thanks to the successes of our legions uh, against Germany and the other countries of the Central Powers. But uh, the establishing of Czechoslovakia would never succeed, um, except uh, the spontaneous demonstrations and the will of the Czechs to establish their state. Uh, this was a huge change. I think there was a question in the first debate how this was possible uh, because at the beginning of the war the most of the Czechs didn't desire uh, their own uh, state. But the situation changed. They saw that Austro-Hungarian uh, monarchy is losing the war. They saw that uh, they are uh, subordinate to Germany, which the Czechs didn't agree with. Uh, they were very uh, unsatisfied with the situation here in Bohemia during the war. So the uh, minds of the Czechs uh, changed during the war, and in October 1918 there are big spontaneous demonstrations, as you can see here. Uh, it's very interesting that the first thing which disappears during uh, Putsch or Revolution are the symbols. So in the previous picture you saw the symbols of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy that were uh, damaged you know, on the 28th of October uh, in Prague. This is another picture from the same day, probably you know it, most of you. Uh, it's a picture captured in the St. Wenceslas Square, and there was a spontaneous demonstration which was uh, finished by uh, putting a flag to uh, the statue of St. Wenceslas. So it was a high peak of the spontaneous activity for uh, the new state. But of course, uh, the new state can be proclaimed uh, only by the will of the people in the streets. So there were five uh, politicians, members of the so-called National Committee, uh, we call them the men of the 28th October, who uh, declared the independence officially on the same day, and they created also the first uh, law, the first bill of the Czechoslovakia. Uh, it's very interesting that they never mentioned that the new state will be a republic. They just mentioned it's Czechoslovakia, and that the state form will be solved later, because they didn't know what kind of state, what form of the state will be decided. At the same time, uh, there was a negotiation in Switzerland in Genoa, and uh, the members of the foreign and the home resistance met together for the first time at the end of the war, and Edward Benesch uh, decided or uh, told the members of the home resistance that it's decided that the new state will be a republic, which was something new for the Czechs. They were not used to a republic uh, institution, and it was uh, very unusual for them to get used to it, which can be documented by the next picture, because as most of you know, uh, our first president, Masaryk, was for us something like uh, the old monarchs, because the Czechs were not used to the republican system, so they idealized uh, their own, uh, their first president as the president liberator, and uh, he knew about this uh, situation, so as you can see, he portrayed himself uh, very often on horseback, uh, and he used this uh, presentation as the old kings. Uh, he also used Prague Castle as his seat, etc. So there was a uh, very strange position of the president, but it will be for a longer discussion. Uh, the last two pictures, uh, of course, uh, the state uh, didn't uh, begin uh, its existence uh, in October of 1918. It took a very long time before the state secured its borders and before it created its appearance, which lasted, of course, until uh, the treaties uh, in Versailles, Saint-Germain, etc. So this is the final appearance of the state. As you can see, it contained also uh, 
the regions that were not originally planned for the project of Czechs and Slovaks, which is uh, especially of Carpathia and Rutenia in the East. And the last uh, map, the last picture, shows the national uh, minorities and the ethnic situation in the state, which was a key problem that the Czechoslovakia had to solve, because as you can see, the two thirds of the state of the national, mm, yeah, uh, of the nationality uh, were created by minorities, especially the Germans, who disagreed with the establishment of Czechoslovakia because they became a minority from a privileged nation in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. It's very interesting that one day after the proclaiming of Czechoslovak independence, there was a huge uprising in our borderland, and the Germans uh, were trying to create a new state or to join uh, the Austrians after the war. But this is for a longer speech. I apologize that I made it so briefly. When I teach it at school, I uh, do it for three or four lessons, but this was in five minutes. I'm not sure if I mentioned everything, so I apologize to those who know our history very well, but perhaps we'll discuss it in the second part of the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was also a very clear overview of what had happened uh, here. Well, uh, if we should summarize a little bit, uh, if you give uh, a little title or definition of 1918, to each of your situations. So you said civil war. Lukas said national unity. What would you say for button? <laughs> Total, Total loss. And Václav? Uh, creation of a new state. Creation of a new state. Okay, so uh, here we are with these four different uh, situations. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, one thing that I noticed, Lukas declared Poland as probably the most positive perception of uh, the heritage of 1918. Uh, would it be like that, uh, Václav? Do you agree? Mm, the Czech part of the story, not Czech or Slovak, I would say, but the Czech part, wasn't it very positive too? Yeah, of course, it is very positive for us. But as was mentioned in the first debate, uh, it's the Czech story, the Czech national story, but uh, perhaps the Germans who live here would not, disagree, would, would not agree with uh, the positive meaning of this year. Uh, the Slovaks, it's also problematic if they are satisfied in the state, if they are satisfied with the idea of Czechoslovakism. <coughs> so I think it's positive for us, for the Czechs, uh, now at the moment, but it didn't have to be positive for those who live here with us uh, previously. Lukas, what do you think? Yes, of course, but uh, in Poland uh, there are some uh, dark moments in this national unity. The first is the story of Poles who were left, all those Poles who were left outside, especially the Poles who were left in the Soviet Ukraine and Belarus and later became victims of the, of the Soviet oppressions and genocide before the Second World War. There is a story of Zaolzie, the part of Silesia, uh, Czechian Silesia, which was uh, annexed by Czechs in, 19, uh, in uh, 1920. And of course, the other very important story for Poles is the story of, of, of the national minorities which started in 1918, which, let's say, um, if you are, for example, descendant of the, of the Ukrainian citizens of the Second Polish Republic, probably the view of, of, of this national unity and uh, all those successes of uh, Polish regaining independence are completely different. Uh, but still, that's mostly, like in every country, very important moment for the historians and their debates, uh, but the popular view of the majority still is, uh, still is the same like, like it was before. So if uh, we can continue with the two of you, we heard that in Central Europe it was more or less positive. Uh, from the perspective of, of uh, Belgians or people in Finland, uh, do you ever think uh, talk about what it meant for Central Europe, or is it something completely out of interest? <laughs> okay, that's that requires a longer answer. So, because according to me, an average Belgian person um, does not automatically associate 1918 with Central and Eastern Europe, and there are a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that 1918 on itself doesn't mean anything. It says in a, in a, in a framework of 1914, 1918. And what it means is this impossible task. And then it ends in a victory, but what does that victory actually mean? And in Central Eastern Europe, I have the feeling that 
can be decoupled, or it is decoupled. So um, what comes up is the independence, and what is overshadowed is, is, is the, <coughs> the war part before. And sometimes um, in, you have narrations, I, I'm very well um, familiar with the Polish case, but I can imagine it's also the case with other um, Central European states, that there is this link between nationalist strife, sacrifice, and victory. Now, you don't have this link in the Belgian case. There is not a nationalist strife going on. Um, there is not, and the sacrifice doesn't outweigh the victory. Yeah. So, on the first way, Belgians cannot possibly connect these elements. First of all, Belgian independence did not come about in this way in 1830. So what happened was that Belgium was this um, result of a geopolitical problem that was solved by great powers and it was baptized as a, as a, as a neutral state. And then when it happened in 1830, then later on, people within the country started to think how they could come up with Belgian nationalism as a way to legitimize the country. It was the other way around. Now you could say, during the First World War, what was going on with Flemish nationalism? Yes, indeed, just before the First World War, you had this first um, Flemish nationalists coming up with the, uh, the claim that they, could, they would like to live in, an own, in, a, in a state of their own. Um, this is also the time period in 1912 when you have Jules Destrie saying to the, the King of Belgium, si, il n'y a pas de Belgia. there are no Belgians. And then you have the First World War. But then you have this clumsy flamme politic here yeah, of the German occupier that actually gives um, much more uh, um, rights to these Flemish people, but under a very specific regime of occupation. And that means that um, once the war is over, um, this is not as in the former presentation um, in the former panel. Um, there was this, um, in the Czech case, one said there was this unity about in, in the national movement, in the Czech national movement. Well, you didn't have any unity in the Flemish national movement at the end of the First World War. This was something that they had to cope with for the rest of, well, for the rest of the interwar period. So this means that even for today, for Belgians, it's very difficult to understand this, this link with this nationalism and independence there. And, and another element is, why should they possibly care in the sense that Central and Eastern European countries became independent? But look at the interwar period. Um, how much of these regimes were actually democratic? Mm -hmm. yes. So there is not even on an European level this, this narrative of a common democratic destiny, so to speak. And, and OK, I do admit that also the Belgian democracy was very fragile at the point. But <coughs> In, 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 in the mindset of many Belgians, well, they came about as this most liberal country um, in 1830, and then they see what happens to these young democracies in interwar Poland and uh, in interwar Central Europe. And already in the interwar years, they were speaking in newspapers and so on with disdain about what was going on on a political level, level there. And in a way, that came back. <laughs> so today in Belgium, it will be very hard to find supporters for the kind of political regimes that are in power in, in Poland or in, or in Hungary. So there is another element, a factor that, that brings us far away from, from, from an ordinary Belgian person in, uh, capable of understanding what is this, this meaning of 1918 in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And it also has to, level, uh, has to do with the way the commemoration of the First World War is financed and is practiced uh, within uh, Belgian society. And that is that um, the funds and, and the interest is going to, to financing very uh, local projects. But I would not even say local, but global, in the sense that local meets global. Yes, so, um, and it's in a very individualized way. So I would give you an example so that you can grasp it. So you have children in Western Flanders who adopt the grave of one Australian soldier and they get into contact with an Australian school and there um, there is an Australian pupil who finds out about the history of this soldier in Australia up to the moment that person arrived in Belgium and then the Belgian pupil writes the rest of the story and they make a joint um, Facebook page for this one specific soldier. Now you can hardly have anything against 
Belgian pupils wanting to improve their English by communicating with Australian kids about this um, soldier. But what it means is that you have, well, Central Europe cannot possibly in the picture in this way. When you tell the story in such an individualized and localized way, it will not come up. So in order to, and this is maybe a kind of solution, but in order to come to this more um, to, to be able to talk about the importance of 1918 on a, on a more European level, um, I, I think we need to zoom out. And this is, this is the job of professional histori hist historians, and that's what I am. In a way, it's, it's to zoom out, and, and both on the level of this, also this global aspect, uh, in order to be able to, to show people what, what went on at the same point in Central and Eastern Europe. But I also want to speak up for, for um, zooming out of the level of this, of this individual, because what you do by putting the focus on such an individual is, is highlighting the people who, in the time, at the time, had a public role as an individual, and these were soldiers. But I mean, society was much broader, and if you want to bring in the women and the children, and you need to look at more at structures where people um, acted as a group and, and remained anonymized because this was how historical context was organized. Because it seemed that you didn't agree, or? <laughs> but uh, every picture has two sides, and uh, exactly the same situation is in Poland and probably in other Eastern European countries. Uh, independence, all the processes around, creations of the new states, all problems created by this, path to the independence. Mm, discussions on how good its independence was after it was created, especially in Poland, are so as, uh, were so as always so important that uh, there was never real discussion on the results of the First World War in general. Uh, at, the, at my first speech I said about uh, how this discussion in Poland about the Second World War and complete, uh, complete forgetting about uh, mm, cruelties of the war on the Polish territory. Uh, the, 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 the symbol of this is Ypres. Everybody knows what happened uh, in Ypres in Belgium, but nobody, even in Poland, knows that first using of the military gas was in Bolepów, which is uh, very close to Warsaw. Because uh, this independence covered everything. And uh, uh, there are many reasons why the nations from uh, East Central Europe were focused so much on the local story. Because if we don't tell our stories ourselves, nobody will tell this about us. And uh, <laughs> there was always so many efforts to cover our stories by stories of the other, by those totalitarian stories created by Nazis or, or communists. And uh, even many people considered mutual European narrative as some danger for, for, for our stories. That we usually haven't been focused also on the other or the other issues. And that's a very big problem which is probably represented by some discussions on the House of the European History in Brussels. Uh, uh, this exhibition is some way very good, but uh, it will never satisfy anyone. Uh, both sides of the European Union, the Eastern one and the Western one, are so sometimes uncomparable narrative and some uncomparable memory that they don't understand each other well enough, even after <laughs> this 30 good years of discussion we had. Uh, but maybe that's why, Lukas, why this initiative is important, that it yeah. provokes that debate, and maybe then enables us to come closer. And it discuss. will be very good in stopping the conflicts and all those who want to discuss uh, the cruel way, maybe it will be very helpful. But what we know is knowledge. Uh, for the Belgians, that this situation with those weak democracies in the, in the 20s and 30s was a little much more complicated than only weak democracy. For Poles, yeah, for Poles, for example, uh, getting to know better that uh, experience of the even intellectuals from Belgium, France, uh, on this topic is completely different. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, before those discussions started 30 years ago, because before the the widening of the European Union and so on and so far, the situation was much worse. We completely had no idea mostly what happened in Eastern and Western Europe. Now we know more, still less enough, but more, much more than we knew 30 years ago. Uh, so let's go back to my previous question about if you ever think about Central Europe and Finland yeah. in this respect. Yeah, I, I will go exactly to that because uh, I would say Nowadays and, and, and later, when, when, when we have this, this legacy and heritage of, 
of, of the civil war, then we tend to see it as a national tragedy. I mean, I mean that, that we don't see that we were actually involved in the, in, in the great war. It was part of the war, the things that happened in, in Finland in 1918. And it was also part of the Russian civil war. But, but clearly the people who were involved in that war, the policy makers, they clearly see the connections and, 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 and somehow the, the, the chaotic things which happened during the First World War and the Russian Civil War are, are really interesting. For instance, if we take, take the, 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 the almost head of the state, almost first head of state in, in Finland, General Mannerheim, who was, who was the, the leader of the white forces in, 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 in the Civil War, he was, before he, he had that kind of position, he was a general in the Russian army, and actually he was fighting in Poland, and, and after the revolution he went back to Finland, and uh, after the Bolshevik, uh, the October, October events, he went to Finland and, uh, and started to lead the army, and, and the, the core of the White Army were actually men who had been fighting in the German army, Finnish volunteers fighting there in, in, in Latvia, and now they return to Finland to fight with, with Mannerheim. So they, they had been fighting against each other in the Eastern Front, and now they were on the, on the same side. And, and another person, uh, Oskar Tokoi, who was the first uh, Prime Minister of Finland in, in summer 1917, he was the first socialist as a, as a Prime Minister, and uh, after the, the civil war began, he was on the red side, not very uh, uh, leading figure, but anyway, he was there. So after the war, he had to flee, and he fled to, to Russia, but he did not uh, go with the Bolsheviks. He went to Murmansk, to White Sea area, and, and formed uh, a legion there, which operated with the British uh, as, as, as a part of the uh, White uh, army in, 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 in Russia. So, so first he was on the red side in Finland, then he was in the white side in Russia, and, and he was sentenced to death two times, once in Finland and once in Soviet Union. And, 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 and then, then after, after uh, these events, there was, there was this thing that the, uh, the, the Great Britain would not uh, accept Finnish independence because they were on the side of the, of the white Russians. And, and one part of these negotiations, why they could uh, accept Finnish independence, was, was the part of to solve uh, the case of these soldiers in the Burman Legion, because they were former Reds, but actually in, at that point they were soldiers of the British Army, and, and they wanted to go home to Finland. And, and, and the, the, uh, the soldiers could come back but, but the officers like Tokoi could not because they were uh, seen as, as, as hardline criminals. So he went to the United States and stayed there as a, as a journalist. And, and when we come to the year 1939, when we had the Second World War and the Winter War broke in, uh, we see General Mannerheim back in business, he is leading the, the Finnish army, and Oskar Tokoi in the United States is gathering money for Finland during the Winter War. So, so uh, because people never know what's going to happen. And they choose the sides they think at the moment are for the best. They think that, that they choose the sides that most likely would win and would be best that they would win. But people make wrong choices. So, so it's, it's kind of a chaotic thing in this. this uh, for instance, those legions, Czech legions in, 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 in Russia, they were well, just small pieces in a big game, and they did not know what's what's going to happen, and and who's, whose side to, to choose. And this chaos is really really interesting in, in the First World War. But well, history, history is always difficult because, for example, Ludwig Svoboda, who started as a fighter against Bolsheviks, later became a, a, a first commander of the Socialist Czechoslovak Army and the president of Socialist Czechoslovakia. But in Poland, uh, there was a very similar case showing that uh, not the class issue was important for, for, for Poland, but uh, the independence issue. Poland was was country uh, with a lot of uh, members of the 
Eastern European Socialist and Revolutionary Movement. Poles and Polish Jews were relatively big number of the of the participants of the October Revolution in Russia, and uh, many of them, uh, many of the Polish socialists choose an independent way, like Józef Piłsudski and his his party, and their former colleagues from the same revolutionary movement, from the Siberian exile, like Felix Dzerzhinsky, became an inventors of the and the creators of the Soviet state, and they later fight they later fight each other in the Polish Bolshevik War. In 1920, um, it always shows in Poland uh, when we discuss this this war issue uh, how much we are focused on the independence. Uh, uh, but it, there were a lot of switching after that, and many former enemies became friends, and so on and so far. That's that's a very Eastern European story because, uh, of course, we know that in Western Europe there are more complicated choices, but we had a, a lot of more, much more complicated choices usually. Yeah. We can feel already from this discussion that there is probably a huge space in terms of seeing the whole story on European level. Uh, now, Vatlach is the history teacher. What do you tell to your children, like to kids at school? And how much uh, this complex uh, uh, perspective is included in what is uh, currently taught at Czech schools? <coughs> So as probably most of you know, uh, the problem in Czech schools is that we, we don't have much time for teaching history, we don't have many lessons, and um, a lot of teachers uh, finish uh, history uh, uh, teaching. If you can tell the public how the situation is exactly with uh, the history lessons. How is it? How is the situation with history yeah, lessons? I, I will tell you, uh, a lot of teachers finish uh, in 1945 or before World War II, and they never speak. Uh, what happened next. So that's the first problem. So we focus perhaps too much on the older history. Uh, fortunately, the situation uh, is beginning to change. So there are a lot of schools, a lot of teachers who uh, fight uh, against this problem and who try to teach modern history the way they were rolling. But um, we have very few time. So, of course, we have to reduce as much as we can. Uh, of course, we speak mostly about uh, the topics that are Czech ones or Central European ones, uh, Western ones, but of course we don't speak much, for example, about the history of Finland or Belgium. So, uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned Finnish history. I think we mentioned Finnish history in the following course very briefly. Uh, then uh, Finnish Civil War, but very briefly as well. And then the Winter War, and as a part of World War II. Uh, Belgian history very shortly as well, uh, in the connection with Burger One. So of course we don't have much time to uh, <coughs> do it so uh, complex, uh, in complexity. Uh, the second thing uh, is history, even the Czechoslovak history is for our students uh, medieval ages. It's something so far. For some of them already 1989 is medieval ages. <laughs> yeah, of course. Because <laughs> For example, my students were born in 2000, so it's very complicated. They don't know that's a problem. Yeah, of course not. So Masaryk is for them an old figure from the textbooks and not a living person who influenced them a lot. So our greatest task is to uh, try to show them that history is something that affects them, that it's really important to know, and that it's still alive. Uh, there are a few possibilities how to do it. We try to focus on personal stories. Uh, the topic of 1918 and the World War One is very complicated because there are no survivors. There are no people who can uh, ask because we try to use oral history a lot in our school and in most of Czech schools. We do a lot of projects, but this is impossible uh, when we speak about 1918. So uh, there is one possibility, and that's uh, the personal documents like diaries like correspondence and other uh, types of historical sources that would show us uh, the personal stories of the people. Because this is the way how to show the history to students more attractively, more personally, and uh, they remember it better than a few dates of few uh, facts from the textbook. So this is the way we try to do it, but of course we have to reduce a lot of other information and other things. Can I ask you a question about education nowadays? Yeah, I would comment this because in Finland we have quite an opposite situation. We have 
some years ago we had a change that, that the high schools they uh, stopped teaching uh, the history of Swedish time. So, so basically the history started from the year 1809. So, so from the Russian period and, and so on, but, but we will come to, to, to present day in our schools. So, so for instance, what, what the Finnish uh, history, in the school history, what they are, for instance, about, about uh, Czech, Czech history, uh, I would say uh, we, we had this, uh, after the First World War, this birth of new nations, that's part of their, then, then in, the, uh, in the 30s, the Czech Republic is remembered as the only democracy uh, besides Finland in East uh, Europe. And, and then, then we, of course, in the Second World War, there is something, and then, of course, the, the, uh, the, the 68 events are, 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 are I would say, in all, all history books. But basically, that's it. So, so, so somehow, it's interesting that when we are talking about other, other countries, it's always a question of war. That there has to be some kind of a violent action, then we tell something. But, but well, that's, that's the way it goes. You are worse than media that often <laughs> speak only about negative stuff. <laughs> so, just a joke. Uh, no, I wanted to, to, to give you some illustration about how World War One is um, educated um, in Belgium because this is a topic that has been very well covered and a lot of research has been done. Um, and a lot of um, well, effort has been put into bringing this to, to very small kids, but also to the general public who is not longer going to school. <laughs> and um, it's actually amazing uh, the kind of initiatives that have been launched, and it gives you a very diversified picture of what was going on during World War One. So, um, especially during the last years, um, uh, one has uh, come to terms with the colonial past of Belgium, for example, so it focuses also on the on the Congolese um, soldiers who fought within the Belgian army and also died for the Belgian kingdom. You have more and more work on these refugees, on the Belgian refugees that are abroad, and it's used as a platform to also speak about the refugee crisis today, not only in classroom, but also by means of um, e um, exhibitions where one goes with migrants and one interviews on migrants and that's coming on television. and. So you have a very um, this awareness to bring it to to the today's um, context, and you have this 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 also Flanders that wants to put itself on the on the map of the world by means of of, of um, this teaching about pacifism. You have these initiatives like being 18 in 2018, and then they invite people from all over the world to come to West Flanders, and then they are sitting in the sun and looking to all this. Um, um, more cemeteries and, and coming up with a common message of, of peace. So um, you can hardly have anything against all these educational projects in itself. Um, but as a professional historian, I always ask: so if, if, if that is the only thing that stays with the with the pupils, we're never going to get them to the to a European understanding of it. And therefore, one really needs to. That's zooming out, and in my personal research, which is a comparison between Belgium and, and, and Poland, I do find some indications of how that how that narrative could look like. Um, and I think uh, if we would focus more on the on the social aspect, on, on the aspects of social democracy, then I see in, in my sources um, something that is that is comparable in the case of Belgium and Poland. And I cannot speak for Finland or the Czech Republic, but maybe you can just add on. Um, and one of it is, is, is one of the great things that came out of World War One in, in the Belgian case is um, a universal suffrage in the sense of one man, one vote, not one woman, one vote, this one man, one vote. Um, that going through this war experience um, uh, created a more um, democratic feeling uh, within a, a society so that after the uh, First World War, we won't change the system. And you also see that uh, in independent Poland, and there it goes also for women. So there you have universal suffrage, and this is so you come to a more social version of, of democracy. And the other thing is that so when Belgium was occupied, um, um, food was systematically dis um, exported to Germany, and there was a huge uh, danger of these people being in hunger, and there was this very, very huge um, relief program that it's, it's actually amazing because for four years in a row, up to 10 million of people received additional food from abroad. So there was a very huge distribution network from America, from Great Britain. And also within the country, you had this, this was distributed. There was a whole network of how 
how to distribute food. And even in the hunger winter, for instance, of 16 and 17, the, the percentage of um, infant mortgage was mortality was lower than before the war. So and this was a very, very strong argument after the First World War to see that to say that we, we need um, like central organization of healthcare and nutrition for small babies and their mothers. And you have a similar um, initiative also in, in, in Poland before it became independent. Already during the war you had this with the children, this initiative of sending the children from Warsaw, from the city to the countryside um, to get better food. And this was um, communicated as a, as, as a way to build a, a, a future um, Polish nation. So you also have the, the social element in there. But it's, it's unfortunately that we're still telling the history of the war through the perspective of, of soldiers dying on the battlefield and not about social structures in a way. It's, it's very joyful some way, but in Poland that's changing a little, because uh, uh, last year, that's the beginning, but that's years of the, in, of, the, of the discoveries of our history, of social history. Uh, that uh, Poland, uh, as a new independent state, fighting in the wars was at the same time very quick in some social reforms, like giving right, vo uh, vo uh, right of votes for a woman, or uh, giving the workers uh, a right for eight hours long working day. Uh, and also, that's coming a little into the Polish general debate on the centennial of independence. All those problems with the destruction of the country, with the problems of the normal people, with uh, this relief given by the people like Herbert Huber and the others. That's a change because uh, uh, it was really forget. Uh, as I said at the beginning, in Poland, the problem was the cruelty of the Second World War. All those crimes, genocide, made on the Polish territory by Germans and Soviets during the Second World War were so horrible that almost all cruelties which were relatively big uh, during the First World War looked like a relatively small issue and the problem. But the First World War was the real cruel one. We usually remember those soldiers uh, from trenches and the other places like that, but the fate of the civil uh, settlement was also very horrible and uh, that's crazy by the way, we know more about uh, the situation of the people from, uh, from the capitals of the fighting powers where there was no war like London, like Paris, like Berlin. We don't know a lot about the people who, uh, who had a much more complicated situation like Belgium and Poland when war was exactly in those countries. And they were also uh, very horribly economically exploited by the occupants, which is also uh, rather forget. Uh, Poland is for, uh, forgettable always, but uh, the crazy thing is that uh, people always, uh, th at this time, also forget that uh, cruelty is made by Germans in Belgium. By now, actually, all kind of um, research materials that are available are already made uh, available for the public, and so much money has been invested to make this. This, turn this kind of um, historical knowledge, there is also to turn it into a product that is available for people. So, for example, you have this Dienst Orlogsleftover, so it's a service for war uh, victims, um, which was created after the war, and so people could apply there in order to get subsidy. And all these documents can, can be consulted online so that people can actually see. So, this was not only a soldier, but also a person who was deported and so on, and on the basis of this of this like, paper trail that there is to reconstruct stories of, again, individuals. So, again, uh, the context is a little more positive. Thank you. So now the questions from the public. Who has a question? There are two. Uh, this is you. Thank you. Okay, I'm Chris Hedlow. I'm, a, I'm a, an artist, a painter. Um, so, I have a question to the Polish gentleman. Where are you from? Yeah, I'm not from. I'm from Polish Ubisoft. Well, my check is very bad, so I can. So, to the gentleman from Poland, yeah. what is the narrative um, about the, the, the Polish nationalist deeds or cruelties uh, after 1918-19 until the Treaty of Riga, especially concerning the what we could call the first Holocaust in Europe, 
against the Jews from Jewish sources. There are between uh, mentioned between 30 to 300,000 dead. And uh, we went to, with a Jewish friend, we went to travel to this area from uh, Prussianville, uh, Wolf, Chernovitz, this area. Yeah? And um, there is still a, a very strong memory about this. Yeah? Especially there was another effect of this genocide. Yeah? It was clearly a genocide. Um, because there was the last immigration wave of Jews from Eastern Jews to first Germany, Berlin, and then to Paris, France. Yeah? And that, of course, you can imagine if you have, a, you have hundreds of thousands of these Jews arriving, or yeah, maybe uh, it will not help uh, philo-Semitism, but uh, it will help uh, anti-Semitism. Yeah? So my question is, what is today's uh, narrative? You didn't mention it, and you mentioned a lot of other things. Yeah? And especially uh, taking into account that with the Treaty of Riga, Poland doubled, almost doubled its size. So it was not a peaceful nation. Yeah? It was an, an aggressive, yeah? an aggressive, yeah? taking uh, advantage of alleged, alleged uh, uh, populations involved. There were 50 percent of Poles. Yeah? So this, this was enough to say, okay, well, Wolf is ours, yeah? and so on and so forth. Yeah? And the contrast is the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia who never fared a war, who never aggressed anybody. Yeah? And, and uh, so, so is this... Well, let's say, uh, uh, let's say... Not uh, even in Africa, yeah? Let's yeah. say, uh, it was very interesting to listen to your question, because uh, it's always interesting to listen to some interesting and completely unknown among the professional historians concept of the historical events. Uh, I won't attack Czechoslovakia too much, but let's say we can describe <laughs> An action of the uh, part of the Czech and Silesia is aggression, and it's all usually this uh, this meaning of this definition of this is used by Czech uh, historians. It's not a Polish propaganda, but all those happenings in uh, Eastern Galicia are really, really debatable among the Polish and Ukrainian historians. And let's say first time, and maybe maybe I'm a bad historian, but first time I met with the concept of first. Holocaust or genocide, and if I met in my life any concept of genocide in Eastern Galicia, it was mostly focused not on the Polish nationalist. I mean, as Polish national nationalist, you define Polish government or Polish patriots. That's a very post-Soviet method of definition. But if, if I met with uh, any discussions and debates on the mass killings of the Jews in Płoskino, for example, that's not Eastern Galicia, in Berdychev, it was mostly focused on the Berlura army and uh, later by the Budionne. Uh, as far as, as Polish government concerned, there were two pogroms made by Polish soldiers. One of them was made in the roof in November and it was 72 victims. Not all of them were Jews, some of them were Poles, and second was in Tarnopol. Then I will be very grateful for any data because really, really, any Polish historian, even the most anti-Polish, uh, had no idea about you said. And uh, to be honest, as I remember the uh, historiography focus on the pogroms in, uh, in Eastern Europe after the First World War, usually the Ukrainians were the bad guys. Stereotypes are the stereotypes. Uh, the discussion in Poland is not so powerful. Much more powerful was a discussion on a potential holocaust of the Soviet prisoners of war, uh, which was invented by the Soviets uh, to fight with Polish men of Katyn at the beginning of the, of the 90s. Yeah. But uh, when all Polish uh, Jewish discussion on mutual killings or on killings made by Poles were mostly focused on the happenings from the Second World War, not on those. Asla, wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, but Lukash mentioned it, uh, there are people <coughs> that uh, it's quite a myth that the Czechs never attacked anybody, that the Czechs were not so aggressive, if I uh, may not misunderstood. Uh, the story with the Czech inside is uh, quite an example that the Czechs could be an aggressive power as well. And then the Poles became the same. 
Yeah, of course. But uh, the aggression already started from the Czech side, and it's uh, um, documented by both sides that the Czechs. Uh, you got very fruitful debate between yeah. Polish and Czech historians mm -hmm. on this right. issue. That's a real <laughs> displacement for the other nations that we can talk about mutual cruelties without attacking each other. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's especially now when we've got this return of uh, historical conflicts in certain world, all those conflicts on policy of memory. That's quite unique, but still we don't have Polish Czech conflict. Okay. There, uh, there, was, there was a question there. Yeah. I, I kind of want to bring it back to the sort of. Yo, sorry. Um, my name is Wolfgang. I'm from the U.S. Um, bringing it back to sort of the, the pan-European, and uh, we were talking a little bit about the split, uh, you know, between the two sides of Europe. Let's say earlier in the discussion, and this this relates to the the previous um, debate. So, if there's any survivors still here, uh, you know, you might um, I remember that. Uh, so, split in Europe uh, in 1918. Okay, of course, in, in the eastern part of Europe, you have the creation of new states um, with the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, in Western Europe, mm, as far as I know, not really with the exception of Ireland. It's kind of the only new major player that comes out. Um, so there's that. And then, of course, after that, you have the Iron Curtain, which is further separating it. But I think there's another, there's another factor that is important today, and I want to know if you agree with this, that there's... In the mid 19th century, this idea, this organic nationalism, kind of starts in Germany, and it goes east. And it's this like, sort of idea that you know, like we have a tribe, you know, going all the way back to sort of this like horizon in the past, and that it continues today. And we're the same people, you know, we've always been here, and this is our land. And one day we're going to have a nation. So this is kind of an organic nationalism. Whereas in Western Europe, you don't really have that. Uh, in you know, for example, France, in in the UK, in in Belgium, you have different ethnicities, different nationalities that are identifying themselves based on civic nationalism, which starts, you know, I think mostly with the French Revolution and then, of course, with the establishment of Belgium, like you were talking about the Flemish. Um, so I want to know if you, you, you three on this side sort of agree with that split in Europe and if this is something we should be teaching in schools more about, about this kind of nationalism, and if um, what, what you would recommend, I don't know, doing in the future. Our Hungarian guest earlier said that maybe thinking more civically about nationalism instead of um, organically like we do with the historical narratives in Czechoslo Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland. Uh, for you, Finland, I'm sorry, I don't know that much about Finnish history. Where do you fit into the European community on this issue? Thank you. So if you can... Uh... Yeah, I can, I can start. Great. Yeah. I, I don't um, agree with the split between East and Western Europe and much of my research is actually on bringing in a European narrative and you can look at the work of uh, Tony Judd for example, the B late uh, Tony Judd who said like if we are going to continue um, explaining the history from a political point of view that is what we're going to say but if we're going to see but if we're going to explain the 20th century as uh, the biggest event is the rise of the of the importance of the state in terms of social policy then you're going to see very much um, Congress uh, said very much uh, similar developments in Eastern and Western Europe and now it's all about, about what we're going to uh, see as more important but the kind of um, historiography I'm, um, I'm conducting is more the bottom up to see what matters to the people on the ground and then you see that these big narratives on political um, changes are, are less important than the kind of um, well, social benefits they receive on the ground so there I don't agree with you and the, 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 the difference between ethnic and civic nationalism has already been um, debated much and has actually not been considered correct and in the case of Belgium for example you do also have ethnic white nationalism in, uh, during romantic, romantic times so it goes back and forward and it, it, I don't consider that to be a good um, well, conceptual framework to think with when looking at European history. I think my predecessor was right but the problem is not a real split, but the way people think about the split. Uh, many people think that the split uh, really exists, that there is a Western Europe without nationalist problem, without uh, nationalism, with civic societies, with civic definition of the state, and there is this wild Eastern Europe with all those problems. We need much more education. That, that's a problem. Educate, educate, and educate. Show people 
uh, how much similar we are and how much different sometimes we are. Um, as I said a uh, few minutes before, in 1989 situation was much worse, the stereotypes were stronger and I think we changed a lot uh, in the last 30 years, especially because of many um, waves of the of the immigration, all those Poles who came to the United Kingdom uh, look like normal people for the British and they change a little meaning of the Eastern Europe and the same is with the travels of the people here to the Eastern Europe. Many people read about Poland, Czech Republic, uh, Czechia. So that's the change. <laughs> Slovakia and uh, Hungary, uh, much more than they uh, did before. And uh, I think that's a very important role for the history teachers uh, and for the people themselves to, to, to change this topic. Yeah, I'm not sure if I add something new. I agree that it's still a great uh, task for us to teach this. Uh, because we really teach history from the political point of view, mostly. So perhaps it's still a great task to uh, take this perspective to our uh, textbooks and to our viewing of history as well. But uh, we almost don't do it. So it's a great task for the future. What a challenge. So how does Finland fit well, into well, this? Uh, I don't believe in this completely either, but, but uh, one thing which we did not discuss is the question of language. And, and for instance, in, the, in, in Finnish case, we were part of Sweden for, for centuries, and, and the official language was Swedish. So, so all the papers were made in Swedish and, and, and so on. And when Finland was, was uh, annexed to Russia in 1809, the, the official language was still Swedish. So the Swedish was, was, was used by all the officials till the uh, 1860s and then it started a uh, uh, change where Finnish was, was uh, getting more ground during the, the, the coming years. So, so actually the, the Russian rulers are supporting uh, Finnish national state building by supporting the Finnish language. So uh, the, this question of uh, when, when Finns were in, in the 19th century, when it was peaceful, this kind of nation, nation building, and, and not like an, we want an independent state, we want it to be a nation in the Russian Empire. And uh, at that time, so basically there was this idea that, that we, we don't want to be Swedish, and we don't want to come to be Russians. <laughs> So let's stay Finnish, and and uh, and I, I I'm not sure if there is difference between uh, or, or some similarities in this respect with with uh, other Eastern European countries. But for instance, this language issue was very important for for our identity. There is a comparison with Poland because we have to remember that before the partition of, of the Commonwealth Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Polish culture dominated in the territories of the present Ukraine, Belarus and Lithuania, and later all those new independent movements in Lithuania changed uh, change the situation in Belarus and Ukraine too. And that's a very big problem for the present, um, for the people living now, because uh, in their mind it's completely impossible that uh, people consider themselves to be Ukrainian and speak Polish 200 years ago. That's, that's completely new for them, because they were raised in this new let's say very nationalistic concept of the, of, the, of the society. But that's still our role, talk about this and, and fight with the stereotypes, which is uh, hard sometimes, harsh. Yes. We can pick up one more question, is there some? So, arriving. A question for our... Uh, my name is Stalin from Prague. Uh, question for the Finnish guest. Uh, can you imagine Hypothetically, if whites won in the Russian Civil War, would Finland be independent? <laughs> well, uh, this is a very interesting question, of course. We, we can't know, because whites were not able to win. They, were, they, they had two, two big differences. And, and basically the problem was that, that the, uh, the, the white side in, 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 in Russia, they wanted to bring back the emperor, even though when the emperor was killed, they still wanted to have this kind of royal state, and the people did not want that. And, and, and they, they were not organized, they were not working together, and, and the great miracle of, of, I don't know if the miracle is the right word, but, but anyway, the, the, the big surprise is that, that the Bolsheviks
Bolsheviks were able to keep the power in their hands. And, uh, but I would say it's quite evident that, that uh, the, if whites would have won, they would not have uh, liked to have an independent Finland. They never, in their official papers, they never accepted it. But, but the Bolsheviks did. And, and Lenin said already in, in summer 1917 that these uh, nations should be uh, able to decide if they want to, to, to get, get out of the, the, the Russian, Russian state. And it's surprising because Lenin uh, actually lived two years of his life, or over two years of his life in Finland, because he had very good friends in Finland, because uh, they had a common enemy, enemy the, the Russian emperor. So, so the Finnish activists fighting for independence were, were uh, uh, supporting and protecting these, these uh, Bolshevik leaders. Because when it was too dangerous for them to, to, to be in St. Petersburg, they came to Finland. And when it started to be too dangerous in Finland, then they went to, to, to Europe, to Switzerland, and so on. So, uh, somehow Lenin had something uh, to support in, in, in Finland. And, and, and also it's, it's, it's quite interesting that, that uh, he somehow let Finland go. And, and, and he, but of course there was, he wanted to have the peace with the Germans, but that was the prime thing. And, and the Germans saw the possibility that they could get a servant state from, from Finland during this, this process. But, but of course the white side in the Russian Civil War, they, they wanted to keep uh, the state of Russia intact in a way. And, and I'm not sure what would have happened to Poland if, if, if the white Russians had won. It was the biggest problem for Joseph Piłsudski and others, his friends and enemies, to find out who is lesser evil in, 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 in Russia. Ultimately, they choose Bolsheviks be, even if they fight with them, because especially at the beginning, Bolsheviks openly supported the independence of the nations who were uh, the parts of the Russian Empire. Later, of course, it was a lie, but they did. And of course, the biggest problem for Poland was that uh, the Western states will recognize the White Russia much easier than the Red One. And as a the enemy of every part, every kind of Russia, Poles uh, were very careful with this recognizing. But uh, um, you know, the history of the 1980 is a history of of, of happy accidents. Uh, Poland won its uh, its uh, independence. Uh, Tomasz Garin Masaryk won Czechoslovakism, uh, but H Hungarians lost their imperial concept and they are, have got, they've got problems with this until now. Balts won their independence, Ukrainians did not. Uh, it shows us how difficult history is and uh, sometimes works very, very unlogic. But the policy of memory has problem with this because for the policy of memory everything should be straight. Everything should be defined, everything should be black or white. Uh, I mean, of course, this bad part, the bad kind of the policy of memory, which sometimes works in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this thing that things won't have to be stra straight, it's, it's problematic. For instance, in this discussion we have in Finland about the civil war, it's the, it's the thing that if red would have won, uh, we would become a part of the Soviet Union, and it would be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. well, well, probably yes. But of course, the red. Who knows? But, but the Reds who were fighting, they were not fighting for the Soviet Union. And we know for sure that in, in, the, in the Russian Civil War, the most of the people fighting on the Red side were not fighting for the Soviet Union. They were not fighting for the future purges or, or Stalinism. Uh, by the way, Joseph Stalin was probably the biggest supporter of the independence of other nations in 1990. Or maybe he only played. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, the last thing, very briefly. Uh, did you learn something surprising today? <laughs> oh, I did. Similar thing. Similarities and differences between the nations. Where are you from? Finland. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the biggest surprise? <laughs> um, biggest surprise? Mm -hmm. Or a point of view, some perspective? Well, I think it's a good point that the, the, the history from a political point of view is not enough, but we need to understand the everyday life. Thank you. What about you? Very from? I am Austrian, but I'm living since the 90s here in Prague. So I'm quite familiar with uh, Czech, Slovaks, Hungaria, and Poland. But I am so thankful what I heard about uh, Finland and Belgium. 
because it really awakes me how little I know. Thank you. Very well. What about you? Well, I can I can only agree with my uh, you know, that it is uh, for me the, the view of the World War One and 1918 is much more complex than we thought here from our own perspective. This probably will apply for many of us. Thank you for this discussion, and I think you will continue in an informal debate later on. I hope that uh, this will help to build up uh, this complex uh, discussion about the heritage of 1918 this year when we have 100th year anniversary. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening.